as a good trainer and as a good role player, you should be asking and answering before the event happens. You should say, what do I want the student to learn? What have we taught him? What are we going to reinforce with him? What do we want him to do in a scenario? Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. Okay, sorry about missing Wednesday's production. Uh, we're a few days late, but it was, it's was it been a rough week, so let's get right back on track. The first thing I want to do is thank my Patreons. Uh, and if I haven't mentioned you yet, and for some reason you did sign up for a Patreon or if you've uh, PayPal'd me some money, I please let me know. I'll make it right. I'll give you a shout-out on air. Uh, so tonight, big thanks go out to Mike, to Benjamin S., and to Joe the Individual. Those are my most recent Patreon supporters. What else do we got for you for the show? Contact. Go to the website, uncensoredtactical.com, or you can email me. It's pretty easy. It's uncensoredtactical at gmail.com. You could also find me on Instagram at uncensoredtactical. And I'm not on Twitter very much lately, just a heads up. So if you sent me a message there, I might not have even checked it over the last week. Sorry about that. Disclaimer, adult topics, adult content, adult language. Boom, roasted. Next, we are drinking, again, some Hudson Whiskey Baby Bourbon. I'm doing that in Coke. Um, and we're going to enjoy a nice chat tonight. So without any more stalling, here we go. Tonight is tactical readiness drills that you can do. So I'm going to lay out about five, six, or seven different drills of testing your skill set. Uh, I'm really going to harp on some variables. So the, I'm, I'm big, ever since I've been teaching my course, I do things based on principle a lot, and especially when it comes to training. Training, I think, is my forte. I love it. It makes me, makes me happy. So I don't like a captive audience. I don't like to force people to do training drills, um, but I'm going to give you some recommendations, and I want you to try some basic options for these if you can. Uh, and I want you to experiment and switch up the variables where it fits for you. So let me... Man, my phone keeps... Give me one second. I don't do very much editing for my breaks and my screw ups. So I'm gonna look something up for you real quick and this is gonna take just a second. And done, okay. Test number one. You have heard me talk about this, hopefully recently, I've been talking about it quite a bit. It's not my great idea, it's been around for a long time, but the same way that firefighters have a uh, bunker bag where they have their boots and their gear, they just jump into the bag, put the pull the straps up and boom, they're in their uniform. Same thing for us. What is the purpose of the bump bag or the bump in the night bag? Every human has a right to defend their home when something goes bump in the night. No matter, no matter who it is that brings violence to your doorstep, you are a human. You have the right to protect yourself and your loved ones. If you're going to use that framing, shouldn't you be at least a little bit above average with your preparedness for responding to said bump in the night? Let's talk about that. If you're completely unfamiliar with the term, let me give it to you in some brief descriptionary steps. Oh, you know what? I haven't even had a sip of my drink yet. Okay, here we go. Oh, man, that's nice. Okay, so the bump in the night bag. If you go on Amazon and you Google canvas, Google (laughs) Amazon, whatever, same fucking thing now, right? If you go on the internet and you search for purchasing a canvas parachute bag, it's probably like a... I don't know, like a foot and a half by foot and a half. I don't know, two feet by two feet, something like that. So a big green canvas bag. So you get that bag, you empty it out, you unzip it, you lay it on the ground flat, right? And you open it, kind of like you're getting ready to put some stuff into it. You stand next to that bag with your easy on-off boots that are on in your feet, on, in your feet, on your feet. You have your tack pants, tack pants on. You have some type of cl- quick clip belt around your waist. Um, you have your upper armor if you have it nearby. So you step into the bag with your boots and pants on. You undo your pants and you roll, you kind of scoot your pants down around your ankles. You step out of your boots. So now in the bag, you have flat on the floor, you have an open bag. And on the bottom of the bag, you have your boots and the pants have been brought down around the ankles of the boots. I have an article. Uh, I will link it in today's show notes. Let me put a note to make sure I link this for you. 
I hate, I've missed that a few times and I'm sorry about that. So while I type it in so that I don't miss it, link to bump bag pictures. All right, I'm gonna put a link in today's show notes on uncensoredtactical.com for this episode, which I think is episode 141. So you have your boots and your pants in, in the bag. Now you take your upper body armor, if you have it, and you take that and set it over the ankles of the boots. Now you take this bag and you put it somewhere maybe near your bed or in a very nearby closet or underneath the bed. You know, do what works for you. Um, so that now when something goes bump in the night, assuming you can grab your pistol or your rifle or your shotgun from somewhere nearby, you grab that and you go, okay, I have 10 seconds to figure out what's going on. You know what? I have the time. I'm going to quickly don my, my armor and my belt and my pants. Here's why. If you run out into the middle of the night and it's freezing cold, your skill capabilities are going to diminish rapidly while you stand out in the freezing cold with no shoes and no pants and your gun. You might look like a badass, and I think that's great. I'm all for it. But you're going to bring your preparedness levels up. You're going to maintain your skill level better, and you're going to survive longer, and hopefully you'll survive, period, with a little bit of extra help that takes minimal effort and minimal setup. Okay. If it's really hot out, and let's say it's, for some reason it's the middle of the day or you woke up late on a Sunday and it's like noon and you have asphalt right out front of your front door. If something goes bump right outside your house and you need, you need to run out into your driveway to solve that, yeah, you can do it. You can man up. But after you stand still for about 30 seconds when you're pointing a gun at somebody and they're proned out face down on the ground and you're waiting for someone else to respond, you're going to have a bad time, right? Wouldn't it be better to not have to worry about, oh, shit, where do I stand? Or, oh, shit, what do I do? Oh, my God, oh, my God, my feet are on fire. So having some quick Dawn boots, you don't even need to tie them. Having a quick pair of pants on that you can just clip the belt. You don't even need to zip up or button the zipper or the button. That is going to greatly increase your capability. The armor, if you have it, optional. If you think you need it, throw it on. Big help, right? And then you can put some things on the armor. You can put a little med, med pouch on there, your tourniquet. Uh, for your rifle, if you're going to have a rifle or a shotgun, I recommend this the sling rubber band method where you take that sling you roll it up you hold it near the stock and you put a rubber band around it so that it's out of the way if you don't need it and once you do need it you just rip it out of that rubber band so now we're greatly increasing our capability to respond with minimal effort minimal impact it doesn't really change the way we live our lives of course with all this stuff you are in control of the variables it depends on whether you have kids in the home or not uh, depends on if you have visitors or not uh, roommates or not Depends on the size and ability that you have for space near your room or under your bed or near your bed. So play with that. Work on the setup. I got to use this the other night, and I was so thankful that I did. Um, long story short, I heard the sirens coming down the street. We live kind of near a major highway. Uh, you could throw a stone and hit it. So we heard sirens coming down the street, and then we heard a huge crash, bigger than a you know, fender bender. And uh, I have my gaming headsets on. And it just went right, cut right through my headset. And I was, I felt it in my chest and I was like, oh, that's not good. And I thought, well, that's weird that there were sirens and then a crash. Shouldn't it be a crash and then sirens? So uh, me and the other person here, we looked at each other and we said, all right, it's time. So we have a procedure, which you can add into your process as well. You don't want to silhouette yourself behind a light if you have the option. Peering out the blinds is okay, but a better method would be just turning the, the, uh, turn, what the hell do you call that thing? The stick that you twist and it turns the blinds, that's an option. So hit the lights, get your gun, turn that thing to get your blind slats rotating, look right out. So we didn't see anything, which was good. Uh, we didn't really see any people, no one running, no one screaming. Uh, cracked the front door open with, with good cover and concealment. And we heard some people just screaming bloody murder. And I thought, oh boy, this is interesting. Um, I had the other person hold security on the front door. I took a few casual steps back into my bedroom, pulled my bump bag from just behind the nightstand to just in front of the nightstand, stepped into my shoes, pulled my pants up, clipped it, threw my armor on, velcroed the armor, took less than 10 seconds, went back to stand at the front door and felt so, I just felt so much more cool, calm and collected knowing that I had some preparedness in and on and around me. So your drill, set up a bag like that, add and, and delete the variables that work for you. If you have a family that's receptive to this kind of thing, and if you can do it without being a crazy paranoid ninja, which I don't recommend, I recommend adding things in your life that don't make you look like a crazy person. Uh, if you can get people involved, try that. So the next time something does go bump in the night, 
I mean, you can practice drills without that if you want, but if it's a bump in the night and you go, if your mind tells you, huh, that's interesting, try it. Just go, you know what? Hey, let me grab this bag thing that I set up. Pull it out, put your feet in, pull the pants up, clip them in, then grab your pistol with your pistol light and walk over and then investigate and see how that feels. So just try it a few times. This is not a crazy training regimen. I'm not recommending that you spend eight hours trying to do it in repeat over and over from different positions. This is just a really nice way to get yourself in a good, repetitive, consistent setup to bring you some success. Okay, that's the first test. I'm gonna take a little drink and we're gonna move on. Okay. So for preparedness, t tactical readiness drills, test number two, this is your blackout test. I really like this one uh, because similar to the, uh, the survival podcast, their uh, slogan, which is helping you make your life better if times get tough or even if they don't, I like to add tactical preparedness so that it will, it will help you live your life whether there is a big emergency or whether there isn't. And I don't want to add things in your life that make your life worse. So this one I like because it has, it could have a huge combat effect, or if you never see a single fight in your life, this could also save your life and really help you and your loved ones. So test number two is a blackout test. Ooh, scary. Okay. I'm take another drink. I'm sorry. I'm yelling at you guys. This is a good topic. I've been wanting to do for a while. I'm excited. Okay. What's the purpose of the blackout test? You should be just as good when the lights go out. That sounds good. I like you should be just as good when the lights go out. I like that. All right. Whether it's lock picking or fighting or driving or shooting or just not stubbing your fucking toe and slipping and falling on your ass and needing to go to the hospital like an embarrassed idiot. You should be good at doing those things when the lights go out too. So let me give you a bunch of different tips for how to handle a blackout. Something that I have been doing for a couple of years now on the first day of the year. And then on the first day of about June, I do a battery check. So annual 365 days, I do brand new batteries for every single thing I own that has a battery in it. I maybe don't count my laptop. Okay. But anything that's a flashlight or weapon light or laser or a sight weapon sight, uh, or my everyday carry flashlight, all those things that have an on off switch and a battery, I change those out on the first of every year, whether the batteries are good or not. Six months into every year, I line all those things up again on the floor in front of me in one nice neat pile. And then I just open the battery case, take the battery out, look at it, make sure it's not crazy, put it back in, make sure the thing turns on and off at a reasonable level. And I stow it again. Uh, sometimes you miss these things. Sometimes you forget on the first of the year. Sometimes an item escapes you. Sometimes you have a new item. Uh, one of the problems I, I really identify that this will solve is things like corrosive or, or batteries that uh, degrade or, or corrode. I've had to throw away expensive optics for batteries that were in there too long. Um, a lot of people that have multiple guns and multiple sites. If you don't do this for six months or a year or two years, you might think, yeah, everything's fine. Oh, I haven't needed that in a while. Batteries are probably fine. But inside could be a corrosive, I don't know, acidic, green, rusting mess. So that's something that this fixes. At a minimum... Even if you just check the batteries on the first of the year and check the batteries on the six month mark, that'll help you. So I put that in my fucking calendar. So I get an alert. I love it. How else can we make this work for us? Another tactic is when you buy, when you use one battery, right? So let's say you put it, you take two, one, two, three, a batteries, you put them in your, in your weapon light. Once you've done that, I go on Amazon and I order four, one, two, three, a weapon lights. If I use a small watch battery, like a CR 2032 or whatever the number is, if I use a small like watch battery, I put it into my object, whatever that is. I go on Amazon, I order two of them. You don't have to do this every single year, but for the first year or two, it's nice to get a reserve built up so it doesn't completely break your pocketbook or your pocketbook, your bank every time this happens. So use one, buy two. Really nice to have batteries in reserve. Uh, I don't have a lot of thoughts on rechargeable batteries. Those are great for things like video game controllers, things that aren't going to, you know, cost you your life if they're not at peak value. Um, but I really don't have any thoughts on rechargeable batteries in your weapon lights. I'm, I'm happy with put in a battery, get a result. Um, 
Okay, this one I really like. Uh, headlamps in every drawer. Headlamp or small, lightweight flashlight. So another one where you don't want to change your lifestyle. You don't want to break the bank. Every single drawer, uh, every single drawer that you can pull out or cabinet that you can open up in my house. I have a tiny apartment, so it's not very difficult. Um, we have a headlamp. If we don't have a headlamp, we have something similar of some small flashlight. I don't think it's overkill because in an emergency, you don't know where in the house you're going to be. And it's really, it's, it doesn't have to be a tactical $300 Surefire flashlight. It can literally be the, hey, look, seven flashlights for $5. Great, buy them, put one in each, in each drawer that you can find. When the lights go out, it's so much better to go, okay, where's the closest drawer? Instead of, okay, where do I store all my flashlights at in the closet? Let me get there. So that anytime this happens, anywhere in the house, you can grab some cheap-ass $2 flashlight and you can see without stubbing your toe, without slipping and falling, without burning something on the stove, without dropping something hot. Uh, headlamps are better, I think, because this doesn't have to apply in combat. I don't recommend headlamps in combat. That's kind of weird. Um, headlamps are better because things like you're wet, your hands are full, it's hot, it's cold, you're, it's slippery. So all these things you can solve with a headlamp and still have two hands. So I really like that. And it's nice that everyone else in your family could know... Um, the lights went out. Okay, great. Where's the closest drawer? Instead of the lights went out, let's all rush to this spot. Or why don't you wait till I get to the spot and back? So spreading that out really helps. Kind of hammered that one for a while, but hopefully you like that. All right. Mounted touch lights. I like this one too. Lots of variables. You can go high end or low end. Uh, you get these really, again, really inexpensive. I don't want you to break the bank or change your life. Really inexpensive touch lights where when you walk past it, if you push on it or click it, it turns on. So it's not gridded into your electrical uh, supply in your home. So they have a small battery supply. Another thing you can change the batteries on, hooray. Uh, put those in a couple places. Bathrooms are great. Hallways are great. Um, entrances to bedrooms are great. If you have a small headlamp or a small flashlight in every drawer in the house, this is a little less important, but it's really nice. Um, and the, the thing I like about it is you can use it even when the lights don't go black, even when there's no power outage. If you wake up in the middle of the night, if you sleep in your bed with your spouse and you want to go take a piss and you're like, oh, you know what? Let me stop and do this. Or, oh, I remember I left the laundry bag somewhere on the floor. You reach over, you click one of those lights. Now you can see you live your life. You click it, you turn it off. Um, that's a lot better than flip, flipping on the light switch for the whole room. And it's a lot better than turning on a thousand lumen beast surefire flashlight and waking up your partner. So I like that idea. Um, those are also really good for putting down by the floor, like down by your feet. So that in these instances, you're worried about where you're walking and when you're getting and what you're getting to instead of trying to illuminate a whole room. So I like that idea. Uh, I don't have this yet. I really want to look into it. I like the idea of auto on night lights, but not the ones where uh, when it gets dark, they turn on. This is the one where it charges when it's plugged into an outlet. And when the outlet senses that the power has gone out, it will automatically kick on. So when it doesn't feel um, electricity pumping in, it automatically turns the light on to notify you, hey, the power has been cut. That's great. It's hands-free, doesn't change your life. Um, it should be low cost. What are we talking, 20 bucks for a pair or two of them maybe? I don't know, but it's got to be somewhere around that. So I really like that idea as well. This is something you add to your blackout kit. Um, having good, durable, high-quality jumper cables in every car for every member of your family. This is a big deal. This is a life changer. So instead of having to wait for AAA, instead of having to beg a stranger, this is a, a really big, uh, this is a really big prep item. Um, it shouldn't be a crazy cost. You should only have to pay for it once and it can literally save your life or make your life way less inconvenient. Could these things all apply in a crazy all-out civil war. Yeah, sure. Oh, it's going to help you big time. But I really like that it's going to help you every single day besides that as well. Okay, I'll take a little drink of, drink of my drink. Um, so I said this is a drill. That one isn't so much a drill. Um, you should get used to grabbing those flashlights from those drawers when you need a flashlight for something. Um, but I don't really have a drill prepared for that. If you have any ideas for testing that blackout stuff besides switching off the breaker in your home. Um, 
I don't know how to turn that into a big crazy drill, but those are some things that will help get you prepared. And if you know they're there and if you utilize them every once in a while, it is so much easier to start learning how to use those during a normal power outage. Or uh, sorry, it's so much easier to learn how to use all these light and blackout tools on a normal day-to-day routine rather than, hey, it's an emergency. Oh, wait, do we have something prepared? Oh, I hope I hope that works. I hope we plugged it in right. Oh, boy. So just use that stuff on a regular basis. Test number three. I like this one. I've wanted to talk about this for a while. I could probably do a whole episode on it. But test three is your cardinal direction escapes. What is the purpose of this test or this drill or this skill set? So area familiarity as well as travel mode familiarity and some things to do when you get there. So here's the drill. You can There's a lot of ways you can do, do some variables. Number one, you can look up Google Earth and satellite maps and or whatever, and you can just take a look. Hey, what is some interesting stuff that's like a 30-minute drive north of us? Okay, what's some interesting stuff a 30-minute drive south of us? And then you have west and east as well. Duh. That's your first step. That should take you all of maybe 10 minutes if you're like, hey, let me find something cool. Oh, okay. Some people may never have done that or they might have thought about it, but it's really, wouldn't it be really nice to know in an emergency? Oh shit, something's going on there. You know what? Let's just get on the road. Let's head west. I know that there's a thing out there. I know there's thing A, B, and C out there. That's really nice. Instead of just living your life normally and going, oh boy, we're going to have to pick a place. So it's nice to have that in your head already. So the easiest way to do this Go on, uh, go on any type of internet map system. Go 30 minutes north, south, west, and east of your home. Pick out a couple of unique things that are there. Maybe consider a route to get you there. This is basic, easy, free, step one. It shouldn't take very long. Cost you zero dollars. How do we throw some variables in there? Uh, all right. Well, you can go an hour north, south, west, and east. And you can say, let's identify a few things here and there as well. Well, what would you want to identify in all these, no matter how far? Some, ga- some good gas stations is key. Finding a good, reliable, 24-7 gas station that has uh, good amenities, that's good. Finding a couple hotels, that's good too. That's really important to say, you know what? We need to get out of here right now. At least we know a place we can go. Get in the car. Let's go. Hey, call Hotel ABC or call Hotel A or B or C. Tell your partner, whoever you're with, while you're driving there. Takes a lot of the stress out of Shit, let's get in the car. Shit, which way do we go? I don't know. Let's just get on the highway. I don't. Let's call it a a statewide or a region wide fire. Right? These things happen. Wildfires happen in California all the time. Let's say you live in that area. Wouldn't it be nice to know? Man, that fire from out west is getting a lot closer. Let's just get in the car. We'll go an hour east, and that'll buy us some time. Oh, call Hotel A. That's out east. Let's go. Much better than trying to figure that shit shit out on the fly. Another variable. A different method of travel. So what is a 30 minute or an hour walk north of your home? Or what is a mile north of your home by walk, like by walking distance? Well, that's way different, right? How would you walk there? Should you walk there? Is it highway? Can you walk on the side of a highway? Would you want to? So even even just doing this research on the internet without leaving your home, this could give you a lot of information. And you have north, south, east, west again. You, this is, of course, there's a lot of variables for you. I happen to live on a peninsula, so there is nothing to the west of me. So that, that would be a very easy exercise. Um, but that would certainly be um, something I would want to consider. Uh, what else do we have? So a bicycle ride, right? A bicycle ride is different than walking. It's different than a car. What about an airport? Would it be reasonable to find an airport north of you, south of you, west of you, and east of you? Yeah, it's a great thing to identify. Um, and these these are a little more for urgent situations. These are the ones where like, we got to go now, get in the car. We have to go that direction. Great. Where's the nearest airport that direction? This one. Great. Get the credit cards. We'll just buy whatever flight we can when we get there. Cool. So these are things really to take the stress out of figuring it out later. And that's all I have for test three. So Cardinal, oh, you can go to these places. You can look up the places on the computer for free and easy without leaving your couch. You can also take a drive out and just swing past. You can say, you know what? I got, I got the whole house to myself this weekend. I've got nothing going on. I got a couple podcasts to listen up on. Oh, you know what? I'm going to take a 30 minute drive north. I'm going to pull over. I'm going to see what's in the area. 
I'm going to take a 30 minute drive south and go home. You can do that over the course of a month or two, and that could be a huge piece of intel that pays off in dividends later. And even if it doesn't, it might be interesting and unique, and you might get a little more connected to the area you live. Super cool. Take a, take a drink and move on to the next drill. Ah, also listing uh, some bug out locations or family members or friends that live north, south, west, and east, or multiples in each direction. That's up to you. Test four. I like this one a lot. I don't, I'm sure I may have mentioned this kind of in passing, but now we have our own block of this for the show. So test four, weapons deployment. What is the purpose of me telling you this weapon deployment drill and how are you going to use it? The framing. We are going to be shredding the myth of, quote, I'm armed so that I can defend myself by using this thing that I'm armed with, end quote. Sounds really good. We're all, any of us that have any interest in martial arts, self-defense, shooting, have heard this phrase from someone. We've probably muttered it ourselves a few times. Yes, you can go to the shooting range. Yes, you can draw your weapon in your bedroom and dry fire. Sure, great. Let's talk a little bit more about how we're going to expand and play upon that. I said the word myth, right? The myth of that statement. I'm armed with this thing so I can defend myself with this thing. That may work. If someone is a couple, you know, 10, 20 yards away from you and they announce loudly and boldly, I'm going to murder you. And then you go, okay, well, I'm going to draw my weapon and shoot you, or I'm going to draw my knife and stab you, or I'm going to take a fighting stance and then put my dukes up and then punch you. Sounds really good, right? (laughs) Big difference between big fucking difference between combat or, you know, a fight. We'll group those together for this podcast. Combat and fight or two people who are in mutual combat. And then you have an assault. Legally, sometimes the word, let's just say for this podcast, assault means you are, you have been the victim of a sneak attack, right? A lot of fights don't always happen when both parties go, you want to take this outside? Yeah, I'll take this outside. All right, let's take it outside. Some fights start that way. A lot don't. So a lot of people prepare for a fight. They don't prepare for being attacked or being assaulted when they're not ready. So here's the drill. Being very, very safe, we're going to use only training weapons for this, not our real weapons and not loaded weapons and not sharp weapons. Let's start with a pocket knife, right? Let's say you are practicing going somewhere where you can't carry a gun or maybe you choose not to carry a gun, but you have a pocket knife and maybe you do some martial arts or maybe you don't and you go, you know what? I carry this for my defense. Maybe I hope I'll never have to use it, but I should be ready to use it. Cool. Let's say you got a folding pocket knife in your back pocket. If you know the fight's coming, take that pocket knife out, open it up, and announce to yourself and the world, here we go. But here's the drill we're going to run instead. Let's say it's a pocket knife. We're going to use only a training blade. I am not going to recommend that you do a makeshift at-home training device. I'm going to recommend that you go online, you get a safe folding knife, pocket knife trainer, I'm also going to tell you, hey, big surprise, you might might be surprised to hear this, this is very important. Training knives, while blunted and smooth edges, can still really fuck somebody up. So be very careful. Don't take this thing out and think that you can go 100% with it. Okay, so one person has a, a safe training knife. You, both searched each, you have both searched each other. All you have is a training blade, nothing else, no guns, no live blades, no bullets. You both understand the rules. We're going to talk about that in a second, too. You both maybe have headgear on or some type of glove or punching mitt. And here's the actual drill starting. The person with the training knife in his back pocket, that's a folding knife, is going to stand there. He's going to breathe. He's going to relax and drop his shoulders. He's going to loosen up his hands. He's going to close his eyes. Both parties are going to be told exactly what's going to happen. The person who's doing the feeding of the drill or the giving of the drill, right? The person with the pads who's going to be... um, helping the person with the knife. So the feeder who's giving the drill set up, he has his, his, uh, his training gear on and he's going to walk a couple circles around you. You're going to keep your eyes closed. You're going to breathe. You're going to relax. Everyone knows what's going to happen. This is not a surprise as in, Hey, I'm going to trick you and attack you and not tell you, but I'm not going to tell you when I am telling you, I'm going to take a few circle laps around you. And then I'm just going to push you, right? Just like a shoving match. I'm going to put my hands out. 
And when I'm walking in a circle, at some point, I'll push you left, right, forward, or back. Your job, as the person with the training knife, is to get your balance, open your eyes, identify where I am, and then... Whenever you feel like it's safe, you're going to take that training knife out, open it up, and point it towards me, and then we'll end the drill. That's level one. Really simple, really basic, really safe level one from start to finish. The job of the feeder, the person doing, you know, eliciting the response is saying, um, I am not to shove you on your ass to knock you down to the ground. I am not to punch you in the face. My only job is to push you in your shoulder on the left, your shoulder on the right, your back or your chest to shove you with about 50-60% force just to get you off balance. And all I want to see is you take that pocket knife out of your pocket, open it up, and point it towards me, and then the scenario ends. I said it twice now. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Here's the variables. You push harder, right? You have a boxing mitt or a training mitt or a focus mitt pad. You can hit someone on the side of the head, right? You can push them. And then you can push them again and push them again and push them again until they respond. You can push them and push them and push them until they get the knife to touch your body somewhere. You can move around in circles until they, until they end up putting their hands on you or their knife or training knife blade on you. So these are all different variables. You can also ramp up the intensity. You can also add two role players. You can also say one role player is friendly, one is not. Or you can say two role players, both of them are, both of them are bad. One of them has a training knife. You don't know which one. All these variables you can plug in in and out. Please, for the love of God, be safe. Please, for the love of God, take responsibility for your own actions. I'm not with you. I'm not your trainer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I hate that I have to say that in this in this crazy world. But I hope that you guys really understand what's going to happen with this. Even if you're just listening to my voice and you're like, Huh, good point. I think you might, if you're mentally walking through this drill, I think what you might find is, what I've found with people that I've trained with and I've been trained from with this drill is, when you've never done this, or when you're just joking and smoking and talking in conversation, you think, oh, they'll attack me from the front, one person, I'll push them away from me, creating space, And then I'll keep one arm out as a buffer, and then I'll use my other hand to pull the knife out, and then when I'm ready, I'll attack them. That's what everyone thinks, right? Who doesn't, right? Everybody, that's that's 101 self-defense, right? Who's never heard a scenario like that, right? And at one point, you've probably put yourself in that scenario and thought, yeah, that'll make perfect sense. Here's the problem. If I'm giving this drill to you, and you have the pocket knife, and we're ramping it up to like mid-level, maybe upper level... I'm going to walk some circles around you. We're going to have a conversation. Your your eyes are going to be closed. I'm going to get you to talk, to loosen up, maybe to laugh or joke. I'm going to ask you some questions. And when you're really not ready, I'm going to push you really fucking hard, hopefully to knock you on your ass. And if you manage to stand up, I'm coming at you with a couple gut punches, a couple shoulder punches. I'll push you. I'm not going to punch you in the fucking nose, but I'm going to tap you on the forehead pretty good. And when you go to reach for that knife, man, I'm going to slap you on solid on one side of the head. And I'm going to try and prevent you from getting that knife out. And what are you going to learn instantly? You're going to learn one, when you try to get that knife up, you're going to try and back away from the person to create space. That may or may not be a good thing. The next thing you're going to learn is when you only have one hand engaged in the fight and the other hand is in your pocket, your attacker still has two hands. So you're backing up, you're on the, you're on the defensive, and you only have one hand to protect you. And it's probably not doing a very good job. Even if you never do this drill in real life, hopefully me telling you this has popped on some light bulbs in your head. What can we learn from just that, from just talking about it? We can learn that when you get assaulted or attacked, which is different than a fight, maybe it's a better option to not immediately go for your weapon, whether it's a knife or a gun, but maybe you want to bring some real fucking heat and some real intensity and you want to attack the person that's attacking you. And then you're going to decide when it makes sense to take your weapon out and when to up that level of aggression. Hopefully that helps a lot of people out there. I know in the gun world, God, they call it what they have a name for the shove and shoot, right? I'll just push them and then I'll reach for my gun and I'll pull it out and I'll shoot them because I created space and I've defended myself. No, God, that's sounds really good. Sounds real good. You know what? 
If you and if you believe in that, that's great. Throw it in the lab. Get a training gun. Not even I don't even like calling it a training gun. Get a training tool that looks like a handgun. Make sure you're very 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 fucking safe and run that drill, right? Someone in someone has surprise attacked you first of all. They haven't announced that they're going to murder you. It's a surprise attack. They're beating the shit out of you while you decide, "Oh yeah, maybe I'll get my gun out." And how many gunfights have gone into the wrestling match realm? Probably a few. Have you ever thought about that? You're trying to get your gun out and they grab your hand. You're trying to get your gun out and they push you on the ground and fall down on top of you. All things to consider. So hopefully that drill helps. Please be safe with that. Please be smart with that. So we, I said we're going to talk about role players and responsibilities with that. It's really important. I'm going to close off this drill with that segment. Role player notes. I have had some very good and very bad experiences with role players in my life. The very first thing I want to make evident because you are a role player, is not a clearance or a license or a decree that you get to act out and have fun and live a crazy role and be free and be artistic and creative. That's not your purpose. That's one of the biggest mistakes people make. And I made that mistake myself. A lot of my team members in the past have made that mistake as well. I've learned from it. I'm going to try and give you this value, right? If we're running scenarios and it's life or death, The purpose of a role player is not to goof off and have fun and act out. While some of that may be some part of some scenarios, you have to remember your first and primary intention, which is if you're the role player, you are to elicit a specific response from the trainee and you are to help them learn a specific lesson. At the very, very basic level for a role player, very basic, right? This is the first time the student has ever done a defensive role playing action, right? As a good trainer and as a good role player, you should be asking and answering before the event happens. You should say, what do I want the student to learn? What have we taught him? What are we going to reinforce with him? What do we want him to do in a scenario? Very controlled, very safe. Let's come back to this one, right? If I were the role player and if I were the trainer, I would say to my student who has the training knife in his pocket, I would say, My job is to teach you that you need to decide on your own when it's safe and when it's not safe to take that pocket knife out. My job as the role player is to push you moderately hard, but not very hard. My job is to push you physically, to put my hands on you, push you and shove you to do it when you're not prepared. My job is to continue doing it. And my job is that if I see you go for that knife, then I'm going to close the distance and I'm going to try and make you understand the fact that maybe you shouldn't reach straight for the knife straight away. And the student should go, oh, that makes sense. And they should try it the first time, right? They get shoved, they grab the knife. Oh, I'm struggling. And then they should go, okay, I just got shoved. Let me shove you back. Oh, wow, cool. Now I have have a little bit of room. What's better? You shove me, I shove you, you shove me. I run, I back up. Oh, wow, look at all that space. Now I can pull my knife. And to learn, it's hard to pull a knife and open a folding knife when you're under stress. That's another thing I want you to learn. That should happen on day one. That's really easy to explain to a student. You should not be tricking your students in the beginning, at least. You should be making it very clear what you want them to do. You should prepare prepare them ahead, ahead of time. And everyone should be on the same page, especially the role players. Advanced role players. If a student doesn't elicit the response you want, a good instructor or a good role player should direct the role player during the exercise to elicit a new response or to teach a new lesson, but it has to be specific. You can't say, oh, let's just, I don't know, let's kind of, let's teach them a lesson. No, not a generalized, oh, teach them a lesson, a specific one. Like, okay, he's supposed to close the distance. He's supposed to secure me and detain me. He's not doing it. We're going to teach him a different lesson, which is if you don't do this, then that happens. Okay, that's the lesson. So as the instructor, I would tell the role player, I'd give him some hand signals or for some verbal direction. And I'd say, hey, do this next. Okay, hey, do that next. And I would get the role player, the student to do something. I would end the scenario safely. And I would explain to the student, we wanted you to do this. You didn't end up doing it. So I had the role player do that to you. And that got you to do that. This is learning. This is combative science. This is the stuff we want to talk much, much more about. I'm hoping 2021 is a year for Uncensored Tactical to start adding some munitions training into the the program. Uh, If not, we can still certainly do some training weapons besides 
shooting back and forth. So this has been a long segment for weapons deployment, but hopefully you've thought about some things that maybe you didn't think about before. Or if you did think about them, hopefully I gave you a little bit more ammunition, no pun intended, to uh, use these things the right way and to get people to be much better operators and much better prepared. So I'm parched. Give me a second. All right. Test number five. Oh, I like this one. I don't know if I've ever mentioned this one on the air or not. So test number five is driver down drills. What is the purpose of this drill? What should it be? What do I recommend? The framing is whether it's a tactical emergency or medical emergency, we want to save lives in a vehicle if the driver is no longer able to drive the vehicle while you're in mid transit. Okay, so that's the training. Driver goes down while driver is like driving down the highway. Everything's great. Oh my God, heart attack. Let go of the wheel, pass out, fall, have a seizure. Or driving through the great big backyard cookout of the US 2020, right? Going through the riot zone. Oh no, a, a freaking round shot the driver right through the forehead somehow, right through the windshield. I'm the passenger. Shit, what do I do? So we want to solve this problem. Uh, I did these drills quite a bit, and it was a lot of fun, and it was a lot of value. I did this back when Blackwater was still called Blackwater on there. We did this on the racetrack out there. Um, So I'm going to explain the drill to you first. I hate that I have to give disclaimers, but please, fuck, don't try this on the highway. Please don't try this in real traffic. Um, I'm just going to tell you for information and education purposes, um, this is an option. Please take responsibility for your own actions. Here we go. Step one, if you're in the passenger seat, you're the one doing the drill. If you're going to start practicing this drill with yourself and and your partners or your training partners or your loved ones, here's how you do it. You sit in your car somewhere in a parking space, probably somewhere private and probably makes a lot of sense, but with the car turned off, keys not in the ignition, windows down, nice and cool, hanging out, cars not going anywhere, engines not running. Okay, this is step one, how we practice and, and learn this drill. Your pretend driver is sitting in the driver's seat. It's a real human, but they're just not driving the car actively because the car's turned off. So they're sitting in the driver's seat and they get to go, wee you, wee you, I'm driving. Okay, great. You are the student learning the drill. So you're the participant. You're in the passenger seat in the car. You guys are having conversation. All of a sudden, driver goes, oh no, I'm dead. They let go of the wheel. They turn their head to the side. They stick their tongue out. I'm dead. So you as the passenger, the first step for you, If you're in an American car and the driver's on the left, you as the passenger, you're going to go, oh shit, my first and constant priority through this whole drill is I immediately grab the wheel and I keep my eyes on the road. And my tip for you is don't grab the wheel underhand like you're doing a pull up with your palm facing you. Grab the wheel overhand. So put your hand up above the wheel and then drop it down on top of the wheel so that the back of your hand is facing up. There's a reason for this. If you grab the wheel underhand, you can pull towards you to get the car to turn right, but you can't really push your hand out to the left because it's too far and your hand doesn't bend that way. If you grab the, if you're in the passenger seat and you reach over with your left hand and grab the wheel overhand with your palm facing down, you can extend and turn the wheel hard left. You can also pull and turn the wheel hard right. So recap again. Step one, when the driver goes down, if you're the passenger, you immediately keep your eyes on the road and you grab the wheel with your palm down on top of the wheel. Keep your eyes on the road now and always through this drill. Keep your eyes on the road and maintain steering of the car. Step one. Okay. As funny as it sounds, um, I do this in some of my episodes. I'm going to repeat this over and over and over for a reason. Here we go. Driver goes down. Step one. What do we do? Now and always keep our eyes on the road. Maintain control of the steering. Overhand grip. Driver goes down. What do we do now and always through this drill? Eyes on the road. Left hand grabs the wheel. Overhand grip. Okay. It's good for now because we're going to do it again. Step two. The passenger, once he has control of the wheel and he's watching the road, he is not going to look down at his seatbelt. He's going to blindly reach down using his hand to feel. He's going to unclip his own seatbelt and control it and get it all the way off his body. 
One of the ways we do this is if you're a passenger and you're on the right side of the car in a U.S. model car, you're going to place the palm of your right hand up against your chest. You're going to slide it to the left so that your seatbelt is over top of your hand now. So your hand is, is a buffer between the seatbelt and your chest. You're going to use the back of your hand to follow that seatbelt all the way down to the clip. You're going to push the clip and you're going to extend your right hand out and away from your body. I know that sounds like a lot of talking, but there's a reason for that. If for some reason you're in tactical gear, you have magazines and pouches and body armor and guns and tasers. If you have all that shit on, you don't just want to reach down over the belt, clip that button and then get situated because that belt might get stuck on your gear. This is a really good way to make sure that that belt gets pushed out and away from your body as it gets retracted back into it, into its home once it's unlocked. Okay, so now let's do step one and step two. Driver goes down, what do you do? Step one, and always, keep my eyes on the road, maintain control of the wheel with a palm down grip. Step two, bl use the blindly because I'm busy watching the road, gonna use my right hand, gonna slide it between my body and the, and the seatbelt, I'm going to go down the seatbelt, clip clip the button, or unclip my seatbelt. I want to push it away from my body so that the seatbelt is now free. And we're going to use shorter words on the next recap. Step one, what do you do? Eyes on the road, left hand on the wheel. Step two, using my right hand, I go between the seatbelt and my body. I go down to the clip. I unclip the seatbelt. The seatbelt flies away while I'm keeping my eyes on the road. Let's go to step three. This step is optional. Let's say you're you're in a small car or you have a, a driver that has his right leg real far up against the center console, if there is a center console in the car, if there's a divider, you know, for the different wheel foot wells. If the driver's leg is in the way, and if it's right up against the stick shift or it's right up right up against the console, you can optionally do a prep step where with your free hand, with your eyes on the road, your left hand on the wheel, you can use your right hand to get that driver's right leg prepped or prepared and kind of skip it over to the left a little bit like out of the way because we're going to do something with that area so that's an optional preparatory step we're going to skip in the future so our real step three is going to be using your left leg you're going to go up and over the console if there is one you're going to go down towards the gas pedal and you're going to shimmy yourself and kind of get your groin right over the middle console of the car and you're going to readjust your hands and you're going to kind of spider monkey yourself into this position. So you want to be right in the middle of the car. You want to have your left hand on the wheel, your right hand either on the headrest or up on the roof of the car or grabbing the oh shit bar on the right. So you want to be firmly mounted into this car with your left hand really close to that gas pedal. So we're going to call that step left leg into the driver foot well. We're going to go back to the beginning. Step one, driver goes down. Left hand on the wheel, eyes on the road. Keep my eyes on the road the whole time. Step two, using the back of my hand, unclip my safety belt and get it out of the way. Step three, I put my left leg in the driver's wheel well. Wheel, sorry, driver's foot well area. And then I'm also going to adjust my body weight, get centered in the vehicle, and push myself left, right, up, down. I'm going to get secure in that area. Step four, gas check brake check. If it, we do this because let's say the driver goes down and his feet are all mixed up in there. Maybe his foot is on the gas pedal. Maybe his foot is on the brake pedal, or maybe his foot is wedged underneath either of those. So driver goes down. What do we do? Left hand on the wheel, eyes on the road. Step two, what do we do? Seatbelt off. Step three, what do we do? My left foot in the driver's foot well. Step four, what do we do? Gas check, brake check. If, it's good, if the gas goes down when you want it to and the car goes faster and then the gas slows down when you want it to and the car goes slower, you're good. Now you just continue living your life and driving to safety. If that doesn't work, you may have to reach down with your free hand or your free leg and you might have to get that driver's leg way out of the way. So that would be your step four. Step four, right? Gas check, brake check. Last step here or second to last step, depending on how you do the drill. Last step should be, you're gonna ensure that you're pushing the driver up against his own window, and you're gonna get a little bit farther into that seat so that you're almost in his lap, and your left shoulder is pushing the driver's chest up against his own door. There's a couple reasons we do this. 
Number one, if it's a medical emergency, like maybe they have a stroke or a seizure, or maybe they get shot in the airway or something happens, this is kind of a, a really unique way to get that driver to somewhat maintain that posture and that airway with their head, their neck, and their spine and their body. Another reason we do this is it gives you a lot more control of the car. If you're really close to that driver's seat and you've got one foot on the gas and, gas and brake, now you can probably position yourself so you can get both hands on the wheel. And maybe if you have to take one hand off the wheel, you can reach the things you need to reach. A tertiary reason that we use that technique where we push the driver up against his own wheel well is if we're going to have another party in the back of the vehicle, like another team member in the back, and if you're going to pull that driver out of the driver's seat so you can do a complete change of drivers, getting them up into the left into the back of their seat, you can now maybe reach down and pull that seat, seat back button to get that seat reclined if you're in that type of vehicle that will allow that. And the person in the back seat can then grab that person by the shoulders, pull him into the back seat, start doing medical work on him, and now you can take over the driving in the front. If you have three people or more, this is a really cool drill to rotate all the way through the car. So driver goes down. Step one, keep my eyes on the road, grab the wheel. Step two, undo the seatbelt. Step three, my foot into the driver's wheel well, and then I get situated. Step four, gas check, brake check. Step five, I'm going to make sure that I'm pushing the driver up against his window. Optional step six, if you have a party in the back of the car, they can reach forward. Maybe they can reach the driver seat relax button, or maybe you can do it, but that seat goes down. The party in the back will grab the driver, pull him out of the driver's seat into the back seat. Now you take over his driver. And then if you're running a drill, you all rotate again, you switch. That was long winded. I enjoyed it. That's what she said. Uh, so hopefully if you guys have never heard of that before, I highly recommend you get your loved ones involved in that drill. I also highly recommend you don't try it on the highway or in traffic. At least not the first 30 times you do it. Get really good at it with the car in park and the keys not in the vehicle, please. So things to consider for an emergency, not something you should do for fun when you're driving drunk. Uh, and we're going to move on to the next test. Okay. I'm going to try and make this one a short one. We're getting close to an hour. Test number six for tactical readiness drills that you can do uh, without breaking the bank and that will hopefully add value to your life. Test six is communication. Comms tests. Like most of the other things we talked about tonight, it's so much better to start doing these things now in your normal life. They don't change the way you live your life. They don't add a huge burden onto you. And when an emergency does come, it's going to be so much easier to know, hey, I've done this a thousand times. So that fits within my framing and my principles. Leaving a note for somebody. That used to be so crazy common when I was a kid. We had one spot in the house that we wrote down the note. We put the note in that spot. It stayed there. No one fucked with it. Everyone knew that's where the notes go if we need to pass information and not everybody's here. I have a feeling that is not as common today in 2020. Everyone has a smartphone. Everyone has texting. Everyone has apps. Everyone has email. Um, I just, I feel even fucking the problem is even not problem. The issue is even kids have phones now. So parents don't even really need to leave their kids notes. I would highly recommend doing this. Even if the world hasn't gone crazy, there has to have been a time that someone didn't have their phone or didn't respond to a text or you didn't know where they were. And you said, Oh fuck, if they come home and they're not responding to their, to their text or they lost their phone or the phone screens cracked, how will they know that I went out looking for them? Oh, you leave a fucking note. I've done this in my own life and I recently and I thought, well, shit, we don't really have a spot for notes. So how do we do this? Well, one is if you're like me and you're crazy OCD, you probably have a white marker board somewhere in your house. If you have one of those and if it's in a readily accessible place in your home or it's close to your front door, that would be a good place. You can use a magnet to put a note there that you wrote on paper or you can use a white marker to write on the board. And if the board board is all clear, you can write in big, huge letters. That's kind of hard to miss in some homes. If you don't have that, um, close to the entrance is always a good option. So just on the inside of the door, hung up so that when you're walking to leave the house, you see it right next to the door. That's a good place for it. So I highly encourage you, even if there is no emergency, this should cost you all of zero dollars 
to try this out. Leave a note for a loved one, even if it's something cute and sweet, but get them into the habit of understanding this is where we leave notes for each other. This is always where we leave notes for each other. There might be backups too, which we're going to talk about, but I want you guys to get into that method. Um, even if it's not tactical or emergency related, you can leave a little love note and say, hey, this is where we leave our love notes right here. Cool. I feel like that's email me uncensored tactical at gmail.com. Let me know some of your thoughts on all of this stuff we talked about today, but I just, I have a feeling this is so much less common today. Leaving paper notes. What else do we got? Oh shit, I might not have given you the purpose. Probably pretty clear. Becoming familiar with passing communication so that in an emergency, you don't have to scramble to figure out how you're gonna connect. Having multiple redundancies. Number one was leave notes. What else do we got? Uh, memorizing phone numbers. Oh fuck, did he really just say it? Yeah, yeah I did. Hopefully you have one, God, at least one Fuck, you get arrested, you're going to want to know one phone number. You're going to want to have it memorized. If your phone breaks, you're going to want to have one phone number memorized at least for someone that can come pick your drunk or broken ass up somewhere. I don't think that's a stretch, right? Here's how you do it without changing your your entire life. Here's how you do it so it's not boring. Here's how you do it so you don't hate yourself and add a burden. Uh, Let's say you're at work, right? And you want to call a loved one. Tell them. If, even if you're texting and calling all the time on your cell phones, anyways, tell them this. Hey, I'm going to call you from my work phone real quick, just so you have it in your phone. Okay, cool, great. Hang up your cell phone. Go to your work phone. If you're in an office or if you're an employee somewhere, punch in the number, the whole number with the area code on that phone, and then just chat with them on the company phone. That's it. Doesn't change your life. It adds value. It's great. Now, if their phone works and yours does, if their cell phone works and your cell phone's cracked, Let's say you crack it on the way to work and there's an important message that has to get passed to you from home. Well, now your loved one at least has a recent call from your office phone. A lot of people nowadays don't even have office numbers for each other because it's, what's the point? So get in that habit. That's an easy first step. Great for your preparedness. Also great if there's a huge emergency. So we got leaving notes. And we got memorizing phone numbers. One of the ways you can do that is by picking one person who's your closest loved one. And if you call them from work, if you have, if you work outside the home, use a work phone and punch in the actual digits every time you call them. It might be a hassle the first two or three times you do it, but it should get pretty easy. You can also get them on board with doing the same thing for you. That's pretty easy. It's not crazy. Take a sip of my drink. I'm running low. What are some other phone numbers you might want to memorize? You don't have to do it all at once, but a significant other, right? If you're in a romantic or intimate relationship, you guys are both going to want to memorize each other's numbers. That's pretty clear. That's not, that's 101. That's not 202. That's a beginner class. If you live at different addresses, you're going to want to memorize your significant other's actual street address or mailing address. Here's one unique way that you might not have thought about that that might come into play. Uh, sometimes for special events, even if it's not an emergency, I know when I was a kid, this happened. Um, I was going to visit a friend of mine and he lived in, uh, kind of a, like a, uh, a, he lived in a neighborhood with townhomes and just on the other side of that was a big park, like a huge, like city park. And I'm going to visit him and there's like a, like a rent a cop out front and he stops me and he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, uh, I'm here to visit my friend. And he's like, no, you're not. The fair's going on over there. He's like, what's the address? I'm like, excuse me? I'm like, I don't I don't know. I'm a teenager. I don't know my friend's fucking address. I'm like, fuck, I don't, I don't know. Let me call him. So I get on my flip phone and I call him. I'm like, hey, what's your address? And he tells me. And I tell the rent-a-cop. And he goes, okay, man, you're good. That's a really easy variable to bring into today's future, right? Sometimes, and police still do this. I, I did this back when I was a cop. If we had a perimeter set up somewhere and we were like, can't let the criminal out, can't let the criminals in. Okay, great. We got this neighborhood on lockdown. Someone would drive up and they would tell me, oh, I live here. I'm allowed to go through. I'd go, okay, what's your address? And they'd go, uh, I don't know. And I'd go, well, maybe you don't live here. So something similar to that, pick your own variable. That could be really important. Let's say you're going to pick up your girlfriend or your wife or your significant other, your partner or whatever, and they're in that perimeter. Wouldn't it be nice to know, hey, yeah, I live with her, 
Or, hey, I'm going to my house. Fucking lie to him. I don't care. Hey, I'm going to my house. Oh, what's the address? Boom. Oh, okay. You probably live here. Go ahead. That could be a big help in an emergency. So memorizing phone numbers, memorizing an address, especially for your significant other. One phone number, one address, not hard to do. And there's a reason for it that I just gave you. Hopefully that helps. What else do we got? Next to kin. Especially if you're in a romantic or intimate relationship, it'd be nice to know one address and one phone number that's a next of kin for your for your partner. Easiest reason to give you for that would be a medical emergency. Super easy to understand. I don't have to go crazy in depth for that. Um, or let's say they, they have a, an illness or a sickness or you take them to the hospital and they can't speak or they or are unconscious. Wouldn't it be nice to go, hey, let me call this person's family to get them involved so we can help. Sometimes that's good. Uh, a phone number to a bank that you are a customer at. That's a pretty big one. Especially, I mean, you can usually, if you can get on any computer anywhere, you can usually look that up. Not a crazy big deal. Um, but it's nice, especially with things like travel, especially if your phone screen cracks. I'm going to tell you a really cool story about why this would be important. Um, a phone number for your bank. They can issue credit cards. They can transfer money from accounts. They can do all sorts of, or all sorts of cool stuff for you. If there's an insurance problem, they can fix insurance, sometimes really quickly on the phone. So big banks like that. Uh, I had a friend I was deployed with. I wasn't with him on the de- deployment that, that this incident happened, but while I was on a deployment, he told me the story. So I'll I'll tell it from his point of view. So uh, here he is on a deployment, and he says, I was so drunk, and I was I was lost. I was overseas. I was somewhere in the Middle East. And I was uh, I was a hot mess, and I got to a hotel somewhere. It wasn't even my hotel. I had no idea where the team was. I had to get back to the ship in the morning. I didn't know what the fuck to do. I had no money. I don't know if he'd been beaten up or robbed or spent all his money in the whorehouse. No idea. But he's stuck. He's screwed. He's drunk. He's at a hotel that's not his, and he's overseas, and he's by himself. He walks up to the the front desk at the hotel, and they understand him in their broken English. And he says, I need a taxi to get to my hotel. And they're like, yeah, do you have any money? He's like, no. And he's like, but call my bank. So he, I don't know, I think he knew the bank's phone number. That We used to, we used to do a lot of dialing numbers over a decade ago. So he gives them the bank phone number, or he had a credit card, or a, yeah, credit card, no, something. Either way, he gets the phone number to the hotel front desk. It's not his hotel. He's overseas. They call his bank. 24-hour customer service line. He gets on the phone with them and says, listen, I'm fucked. Can you open me a credit card right now? Can you give the account number to the person behind the desk? Can you can you take the taxi info from them and can you send a payment to this taxi? Or like, I think it was like, if you pay this hotel 200 bucks, they'll pay for my taxi, which is 100 bucks or something like that. He worked out something. No, no plastic credit card was used. They just used a number for an account and they made something work. And the kid ended up getting back to his right hotel with a taxi that was paid for through his bank, through a phone call from overseas. Getting really low on my whiskey and Coke here. Sorry if my words are slurring a little bit, but hopefully that story was interesting. Sometimes, uh, regardless of your politics, sometimes big banking can use a lot of their resources to help you. All right. A number, phone number you should memorize. At least one person who does not live in your house, who is in your inner circle, so to speak, who, when you need something big lifted or something heavy moved or something done quickly, or you need support, or it's fucking 2 a.m. and you need someone to talk to, have someone that when you call them, they respond to your house or to you wherever you're at. Someone that's local. It's a really good number to memorize. Someone that will help facilitate you getting shit done. Someone that's got your back. Obviously, you don't have to go crazy in depth with that. Emails, we often type those in. Those aren't too crazy to remember. You should know at least a couple of those for people that you need. Uh, walkie-talkies as a w- form of communication. You might want to throw some batteries and some cheap-ass walkie-talkies so that maybe you're outside your housing community and someone inside your housing community, you can talk to them. We'll work out the details. Maybe in a future show, that might be a really cool, unique uh, tool that's low-cost but high-effect. I'll talk more about that later. 
or maybe in a future episode. We got CB radios, ham radios. I just did an interview with Carr from Fagcast on that. A lot of people had some good feedback from that. You might want to go check that one out. I'm not an expert in that. I'm actually not even a beginner in that. I'm less than that, but I'm intrigued and I want to learn more. So CB radios, ham radios could be a great way to communicate, especially in an emergency. If not, it's just for fun. It's interesting. It's unique. It's a great hobby. In an emergency, if you're having a hard time getting someone to pick up a phone, or if you have a really bad phone signal, sometimes it's so much easier and so much more effective and more likely to go through if you send a text message. Don't forget, you can also use a Wi-Fi network on a lot of phones to send a text message over Wi-Fi instead of over your cell service signal. Text is always better over voice in an emergency if you're having trouble getting through. You can also set a text message that will eventually send once it goes through. Let me give you a tip for this. If signals suck, if signals are shut down, if you're losing cell service, I would recommend putting a timestamp on your messages that you send to people. That way, if they're taking forever to send, or if they send once you turn your phone back on, or they send, they won't send with low battery, but once you charge it will, all those unique things, then at least the person receiving it will know, oh, he sent this an hour ago. Shit, that must mean that this. So if you're having trouble communicating and if you identify that, maybe put a timestamp at the end of each text message that you send. Hey, I'm here at this place. The time is this. I'm sending this message now. Send. That might help. What else do we got? Internet chat rooms, applications, and things like gaming. So in a crazy emergency, let's say the phones are down. Let's say the Wi-Fi even goes down. If you're not in the area, if you can get to an application or you can get to a different system like a like your online gaming platform, you can still send that message. It'll still probably make it to the servers, and then whenever that other person checks in, they'll eventually be able to get that message. So sending messages that don't arrive right away, but that are stored digitally, those are good ideas. Next place, two more on this one. Workplace, workplace messages. So understand how to contact your loved ones or the people in your inner circle at their job without being a crazy person, but hey, can you uh, you call their, their central line or their supervisor or their coworkers or their desk and leave a message on that platform? Always a good option. And the last one I have is your neighbors. It's been tough in, since the year 2000. People kind of got away from talking to their neighbors, but while our current events are certainly unique, one of the very few silver linings on this cloud is a lot of people have been turning to their neighbors that otherwise wouldn't have. So let's say your child goes missing or they run away or your loved one hasn't come home when they should have. And let's say cell service is out. If you're going to go looking for them, might be a good idea to knock on the neighbor's door. It might be great if you've already introduced yourself to them and you say, hey, I'm going to look for my partner. They're not home yet. If you hear my door open or if you see them here, can you let them know that I went to this place looking for them? I think that would be great. That's a great resource. It's It's so building a community is such a life changer. That's been, that's my newest and probably going to be my lifelong goal to build an actual physical community where people of like-mindedness are going to live actually close to each other. The internet's great. I love it. I have met so many cool fucking people, all you guys in the audience, guys and gals, whatever. Uh, I'm really enjoying the relationship that we're building. I love that you guys listen. I love that I get feedback. Um, But actual physical in-person community building is something I want to focus a lot of my time on. So I'm going to take another drink and we're going to close out this with my last test for you guys. Oh yeah, test all that stuff. Great job, Pat. No, so (laughs) start using a few of those channels now so that when the emergency happens, you you aren't confused and scrambling with figuring out how to communicate. And even if you just mention it to a loved one, you don't even have to practice, but you fucking play PlayStation games five or six nights a week, just mention to your loved one, hey, if we can't get in touch with each other and there's an emergency, even if I'm another whole state away, I'll get on the PlayStation website. I'll send you a message through that. If you can't get a hold of me any other way, just don't don't forget you can also check that system. Oh, okay, cool, great. So there you go. You trained it. You tested it. So in an emergency, they might remember, oh, shit, let me check that real quick. Different messages get through different ways. All right drink number seven this is an easy one won't be very long that's also what she said test number seven is food preparedness what's our purpose and our framing 
This is to give you a real life, physical feedback, honest reflection on how self-sufficient your food and water supply is, as well as maybe some other supplies. This one's easy. A lot of people assume that they have food to last them a while. A lot of people actually buy food and water, but they, they kind of guesstimate, yeah, it should probably last us a while. Um, I want you to take that a step further, and it's so easy, and if you have OCD like me, it's not difficult, and it makes you scratches your itch visually and physically. You can feel and see what your preparedness is doing for you. So here's the drill, an actual drill. Some of these were kind of tips and techniques and ideas, not actual drills laid out. Sorry. Actual drill. Ready? When your house isn't crazy and full of people and busy, when you have some time and you have some floor space, go over to your fridge or your pantry or your supplied area. Instead of taking a notebook and going, yeah, we kind of got, you know, the 10, 11 gallons of water, depending on how we count. Okay, cool. Yeah, we got like, you know, I see 10 cans in the pantry. It's probably 10 days of food. Nope, not what I'm looking for. Here's what I want. If it, let's, let's keep it simple, stupid. If it's just me, right? If I live by myself, I'm going to go to my pantry or wherever I keep my food and water. I'm going to take one jug of water. I'm going to set it on one side of the room up against the wall. I'm going to take one can of soup, which is a whole meal. I'm going to put that right next to it. I'm going to take one bag of beef jerky, which is like a daily snack. Take that, put it right next to it. Don't need to eat like a king, but that will get me through 24 hours of being alive. Certainly, right? Sounds good. I'm going to go grab another jug of water and about 12 inches away or two feet away, set down that jug of water, go grab another can of soup. Hopefully it's something that I'll actually enjoy eating. You should really be, if you're stocking up on food, there's really no reason you should buy shit that you don't like to eat. That, that only happens when you panic buy. We should be preparing all year round. You don't have to go floor to ceiling with your preparations and stack up your whole, a whole room full of pallets of food, but all year round, you should be considering trying to make sure you have 10, 20, whatever days of food and water. So you put another little pile, you have a gallon of water, maybe it's a, a camping uh, dehydrated food meal. Great. Pick a snack. Great. Put a couple snacks in there. Great. Maybe you're having a hungry day on day two and you're bored and you're locked in your house. Okay. Day three, grab another whole gallon of water, set it down on a line. So you got one whole pile of shit for day one, a whole pile of shit for day two, whole pile of shit for day three. And it makes for great Instagram photos, which I'll be doing soon. So that's your homework. If you choose to accept it, um, an actual physical layout day by day of how long you're going to go. If you have to shut your front door and not open it again for a week or two or three, um, I love, I love that idea. I love seeing and feeling the actual things we have. And the good thing that that's going to help you identify is, oh, great. We have a can of cream corn. I've never eaten cream corn in my life. If it were the last thing I had in this house, I'd probably have to stifle a vomit out of my mouth before I ate a whole spoonful of that. So it's going to help you identify shit you don't want to fucking eat. It's also going to help you identify expiration dates. So here's something unique that I do with that that hopefully will help you. I get out, every time I put stuff into my preparations area, I take out a big fat Sharpie marker and I go, okay, there's, yeah, there's an expiration date. Where's it at? Where's it at? Where's it at? Oh, there it is. Man, that's tiny. Oh, that's the same color as the label. Oh, that's really hard to see. So I take my Sharpie marker and in big fat letters and numbers, I go the 6th of June, 2025. And I write it somewhere big on the label. This is primarily for stuff that I'm not going to use this week and I'm not going to use next week. This is stuff that for most intent and purposes. Uh, we have a really good Berkey water filter. I love it here. We use that 24 seven. If there is an emergency, uh, we have several gallons of water and the print on those sucks. I know that water is going to be good long past the time I'm dead, but it does help us rotate stock. It makes me feel good. It's a good habit to get into. It doesn't make my life worse. It doesn't really make my life much better, but I date all my bottles and jugs of gallons of water that I have. So I use my Sharpie marker. I write on there the, a date in big, clear, bold, sharpie letters and numbers. So it will help you identify that as well so that you're not wasting fucking money on food that you shouldn't be eating. Uh, it's also going to help a couple people go, well, shit, I always said, yeah, we probably got two, three days of food. And in reality, we don't. So it's going to identify that for you as well. 
And I am going to finish off tonight with some editing, and we're going to try and get this published. Right now, it is almost 2 o'clock in the morning on the East Coast. Um, so I'm going to try and get this published tonight. And if I have enough energy left in me, I'm going to eat some dinner and kind of chill out for the night. So I am so, so thankful that all of you folks have joined me tonight. I'm sorry that this episode went out late in the week. I'm going to try to get back on my Wednesday production schedule for you. I look forward to the feedback. I'm very thankful for the Patreons. Um, I know that time is tight. Time Money is tight this time with these current events going on for everybody. If you're not able to, please don't worry about supporting our Patreon. Some other free, easy ways you can support us. You can like and subscribe on the platforms that you're on. If you happen to be on Apple iTunes, I don't have a ton of reviews, so I would love a review of the show. Um, I would, it's also free and easy if you share this show with a loved one who might find some value in this content. But please warn them, we use adult language, adult content. Uh, what else? Uh, if you want to support me on Patreon, a lot of people have a hard time finding it. I think it's because it's a 18 years old plus Patreon account. And that's not because we uh, are gross and disgusting. That's just because we use adult language on the show. Um, so if you're looking for the Patreon and you can't find it, it's easy. It's just patreon.com backslash U-T-A-C, U-T-A-C. And that'll bring you to our Patreon page. Uh, just subscribe for the $2 one if you want. I have a 25, I think $25 one. That's just for the students that are in my lock picking course right now. So thankful to all of them as well. I'm loving every minute of it. Um, what else do we got? Any other housekeeping stuff for you? It's hour 15 in the episode. Um, I will do a couple more never owned a gun episodes in the future. Those are supposed to be clean language, uh, safe for work, safe for family. I only have a few topics left that I want to cover. So if you have any thoughts on that, please send me an email to uncensoredtactical at gmail.com. Um, if you're in anywhere within driving distance of the Tampa, Florida area, I'm still very much looking for building a real life in-person community with people and relationships and training partners and all that. Oh gosh, I got to start doing plugs now. I have my first actual official, um, Shit, what's the word? Bear with me, guys. I'm so sorry. It's the end of the episode, and I've been drinking a little bit, and I'm mentally and physically exhausted. Um, affiliate account. Hey, there it is. So, uh, FortressK9.com. Joel over there, who I've interviewed twice now on the show. You should check out those episodes. Uh, I love the way he speaks. I love the way he approaches training. I love the way he shreds myth with training. So he does some really good work with canines. I've already put a down payment down. I'm going to be buying a canine from him soon. Um, if you want a canine from him, I highly recommend it. The dogs are fantastic, amazing. I've taken bites from several of the dogs of his. Um, they're really fantastic creatures. Um, and they're very, they're not only are they, are they they're like me. Uh, they're able to speak the language of violence, but they're also full of love and they're stable. <laughs> they're, they're happy and they're peaceful when the time requires it. So if you want a canine, go to uh, fortresscanine.com, get in touch with Joel, let him know that I sent you, and he will give you a big discount on the dog. It is an affiliate program. I do get a kickback from that, full disclosure, um, but it also helps you. It's not, uh, it's not a, it's a value for value. For, it's a win-win for everybody involved. So uh, that's, I think, the last thing I have for you. I'm just so thankful for you guys for listening. We're about 150, almost 150 episodes deep. I love doing this. I like bringing value to the world. Hopefully, hopefully you found some value in this episode, and I will see you all on the next one. Have a good night.